All right, we are live. I'm talking today with Lloyd and Sonia, continuing our series about the lies that Muslims tell to themselves and others in the interest of defending Islam, which we are calling Islam's apologetics. Uh, I'll open us with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time together. Thank you for the technology that allows us to chat with anyone anywhere in the world. Uh, it's a truly special time to be alive. We can reach uh, Muslims and other people in foreign countries that we previously had no realistic way of reaching. Uh, we ask that any Muslims listening today approach this subject with an open mind and an open heart. And we ask you that uh, the Christians watching uh, find this program useful and that you be with us as we uh, present the material. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, so to get started, uh, I'm going to ask uh, first Lloyd to introduce yourself. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, it's, many of you will know me. My name is Lloyd, South African. I live in Poland. I uh, spent 11 years in the Middle East working in um, national security, a little bit of counterterrorism related work. And um, an interesting experience while doing counterterrorism course when the head of the course refused to discuss Islam. And uh, we could discuss Christian terrorism, we could discuss uh, Hindu terrorism, and when we got to Islamic terrorism as well, okay, let's change the subject, let's move on. And, um, when, it, and when the subject of ISIS came up, that led to massive uh, issues in the, in the forum and the discussions. And when I posted some information about uh, ISIS being Orthodox Sunni Islamic, I was banned the very next day. So this led me to, um, to well, it made me, it upset me, and it made me decide to, to make the information that I'd learned and gathered with my 11 years in the Middle East public. Now I have a YouTube channel and uh, I'm hoping to educate people on, on Islam with the facts from its best sources. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Sanya, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hello everyone, it's me again and um, I'm Sonia and I have a YouTube channel and I've had it for about a year, it'll be a year almost in April. I'm an ex-Muslim, so I was a Muslim and I was born in a Pakistani family in Great Britain and um, I'm beginning to find a lot of fascinating things regarding Islam and in, according to the Bible, I look at Bible prophecy and um, I share videos about my findings, my Bible studies are all there for you to see. And recently I've been talking about the topic at hand today, which Lloyd is going to talk about today, which is abrogation. I've talked about how Islam is actually set up to oppose the beliefs of the Bible. Inherently, it is antichrist. And um, yeah, I'm happy to be here today to join you both. I'm really looking forward to this presentation. I've been looking at the slides as we were preparing. So yeah, looking forward to it. Excellent. Uh I'm Thaddeus. Uh, my channel is Reason Answers. That's what you're watching now. I thought a, a good way to introduce today's subject would be with a little story about um, a, a Muslim on my Facebook um, page. So he had been trolling my videos. Every time I would post a video or whatnot, he would leave some comment about how I was lying and how it was incorrect. And I'd ask him why it's incorrect. And he would never respond because, of course, he hadn't actually watched the videos. Sometimes he would make comments um that were on related to the video but he thought they were related because he didn't actually watch it so he recently left a comment saying spouting something about these so-called scientific miracles in the quran and i challenged him on that and he arrogantly wrote back that if i could prove that the um if i could prove that the material existed in sources from before the time of muhammad that, that he would leave Islam. So I replied back and said, you know, just trying to set some groundwork, say, asking what would constitute proof and that kind of thing. I didn't get a reply. A couple of days later, I went back into the thread to make sure I didn't miss the reply. And I found that he had deleted it. And not only had he deleted that, every chat comment on my channel had been deleted. Apparently, he had decided to block me for asking him that question. Uh, so all I could conclude is that he got scared that I might actually have evidence and then he would have to either go back on his promise or actually leave Islam. So instead of 
uh, so he got scared of the possibility of, of information. And instead of listening and finding out whether he actually had truth, he decided to stick his head in the sand and leave my page. So um, I'm just saying with that little story in mind, I ask everyone to have an open mind today. Uh, we are going to have a no tolerance policy for off topic chat. I've already had to put uh, Muhammad Amin in uh, timeout because I warned him about that. And then he immediately said, no, I'm not gonna obey. I have the right to do whatever I want. So he's in timeout. Um, any other Muslims that show up, they will be given one warning and then they'll be put in timeout. And if the timeout expires and they come back and start leaving more crap, no warning, right back in timeout. So with that in mind, why don't you go ahead and uh, do today's presentation. We will be looking at the subject of abrogation. Um, Christians do talk about this sometimes, but I think we don't really fully understand how important abrogation is to Islam and how um, much different it is than what we think it, of it as. Uh, yeah, I agree with that. Uh, abrogation essentially ended a number of laws in the Quran, which apply to not only the Quran though, but also the Hadith. Uh, so very quick overview. Abrogation works in the Quran. So older Quran verses abrogate, well, are abrogated by newer Quran verses where there's a contradiction. Also, the Quran can abrogate the Sunnah, which is effectively the Hadith. Hadith can also abrogate Hadith. So two Hadiths which are contradictory the newer one applies, that becomes a new legal ruling. But what few people realize is that the Hadith can also abrogate the Quran. I know that we're going to get people telling us that's not the case, but then um, these are not scholars. These are, uh, yeah, these are people that, are, that really should not be commenting. So we'll be discussing this in depth. And also chapter nine of the Quran is the final full chapter of the Quran, because chapter 10, which technically is the final one, is only three verses, then Muhammad died from poisoning. But chapter nine is the last full chapter, and it is strictly about jihad. So the final marching orders that Muhammad gave his troops before he died, and his troops, well, I, mean the, I mean the Ummah, the Islamic community, is jihad. So this is the final instruction, and so abrogation ultimately equals jihad. Wow. Uh, Really quick before starting the presentation, I forgot to mention that uh, someone gave a super chat before we started. Um, unfortunately, comments left before the presentation starts aren't saved, so I didn't actually see that, but thank you, whoever you are, for doing that. Yeah. So, and um, so let me begin by, so shall I share my screen? Yeah, go ahead. Let me start with that. I always have to figure it out again whenever I start. Second second monitor. Now let's do that. Has my monitor come up? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, just noting, um, just a fun fact about Islam. There's a wonderful hadith in Sunan Abu Dawud, which is one of the Kitab al-Sitta, the six major collections of hadith. But narrated Zainab, she was picking lice from the head of the messenger of Allah. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, um, make of that what you will. Obviously what this means is that she was massaging the scalp with fine oils from Arabia and that had nothing to do with lice as we, as we know. Um, yeah, any comments from you guys? Oh my goodness. I'm just thinking what a stark contrast to how women behaved when their, Jesus was around, right? How she washed his feet with oil with her tears and this is just this is a it's a joke isn't it it's like car it's comical what, what on well, earth yeah well hey um cleanliness is next to godliness right <laughs> and of course muhammad um islamic science let's, let's have a quick look at islamic science can we perform ablution out of the well of buddha which is a well into which menstrual clots dead dogs and stinking things were thrown. He replied, water is pure and is not defiled by anything. Now, there's another hadith in which he is swimming in the well and there are dead dogs, menstrual cloths and dirty things in the water. And someone asks him, are you sure you should be swimming in that? And he says the same thing and he drinks from the water. Um, so yeah, um, the man was clearly a uh, hygienic genius. 
the hit of his time. Perfect, and he's the perfect example for us all to follow. So clearly we don't need to worry about any pollutants in our water. Just go ahead and use it. It doesn't matter if it's contaminated. It's perfectly good, according to Muhammad. Yeah, 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 That that exactly that. Um, so yeah, let me bring up my slides. Uh, while you guys digest or think about those brain stabbing images of swimming with dead dogs and menstrual cloths. Um, yeah, so, okay, so today, this is called Islam Explained. I'll be talking about the rule of abrogation. And most of the Quran and many hadiths are abrogated, right? So newer verses, newer hadiths replace older ones. And the Quran abrogates the Bible, Christianity, and Judaism. Um, something that, that I have pointed out on multiple occasions before. So my Islamic scholars also tell us that abrogation was necessary to fix Muhammad's errors. As you alluded to in the beginning, Thaddeus, uh, we're told that abrogation is just about how do we fix contradictions, earlier verses, later verses, and changing circumstances. But Islam's top scholars, now we have Muhammad, and below Muhammad in terms of the top scholarship is a man called Al-Ghazali. And after Al-Ghazali, we have 24 scholars who are known as the Sheikh al-Islam or the Sheikh. So, you know, the, these are the major, major top scholars of Islam and their combined opinions formed what we know today as the Sharia. So this, th this group of scholars are the absolute top scholars in Islam, the earliest group of scholars. And what we know today of modern Islam in terms of the, the Sharia and the Sharia law, this is formed by these guys. And we will be discussing these people, we'll be utilizing their rulings, but they also tell us unambiguously that Muhammad made errors in judgment and abrogation was God's way or Allah's way rather of fixing Muhammad's errors. So the things that are abrogated are actually mistakes and therefore can be discarded and ignored because these are obsolete. Okay, so let's consider the following Quranic contradiction. Something Muslims love to tell us is Quran 2, 256. There shall be no compulsion in religion, right? Fine and well, except to even claim, make this claim, to even believe this is actually um, apostasy, as we will see in the Quran, sorry, in the Sharia. Now let's have a look. This is contradicted by Quran 385. Whoever desires other than Islam as religion, never will it be accepted from him. How do you reconcile these two? Good question. And of course, this one is the one that ultimately bears the precedence, right? So abrogation solved the contradiction by abrogating the older verse with the newer verse. Now, this is called the Nasik and the Mansuk. And we're going to have an introduction to the abrogating and the abrogated. This is the abrogating and the abrogated. So the definition of nasq is the words nasik and mansuk come from the root word nasq, which has the following meanings, to remove, to abolish, to abrogate. So we can see this stated in Quran 2, 106, and Quran 22, verse 52. Let's have a look at those verses. So Quran 2, 106. We do not abrogate a verse or cause it to be forgotten, except that we bring forth one better than it or similar to it. Do you not know that Allah is over all things competent? Now, Quran only Muslims are considered apostates in mainstream Islam. These people are on the fringes, right? I know they believe that the Quran is the final authority, but the Quran is too vague. And unfortunately, the Hadith, as Tadis has pointed out in the past, consists, well, the the hadith basically are 80% of what we today know as Islamic law and Islamic practice. <clears throat> so now let's look at Quran 2252. We did not send before you any messenger or prophet except that when he spoke or recited, Satan threw into it some misunderstanding, but Allah abolishes that which Satan throws in. This is relating to the satanic verses where Muhammad thought he was receiving revelation from Allah, but he was receiving revelation from Satan. And he spoke those revelations from Satan and people followed them. And then of course, as we have covered in previous shows, uh, this had to be changed because Muhammad had made mistakes. And in fact, he was um, preaching from Satan. So Allah abolishes that which Satan throws in, then Allah makes precise his verses 
And this Allah making precise these verses is what abrogation is to fix Muhammad's errors. So now Muhammad allowed Muslims to worship the pagan gods, Allah, Manat, and Al-Uzza. Now also there is no biblical evidence for the claim that all previous prophets were deceived by Satan the way that Muhammad was. And this episode is detailed in Guillaume's Life of Muhammad, page 166, also in Tabari. And we've discussed this and I've shown this in um, the first episode we did on this channel together. Any comments before I go on? Uh, we have a comment from Candice who says, why bother abrogating a verse to bring a similar one that says the same thing? That's a good question. Um, I guess only Allah knows best on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Allah knows best. Uh, Muhammad Ali, <laughs> authentic evidence? Like what? What? Your Quran is not authentic? <laughs> yeah. So the Nasik and the Mansuk. So the definition of Nasik, it can also mean to replace or to supersede. In the Islamic sciences, it is the abrogation of a ruling by a ruling revealed after it. An older verse is superseded by a newer verse. Thus, at least two rulings are involved, the Nasik and the Mansuk. The Nasik ruling repeals the Mansuk ruling. More than one verse can abrogate a single ruling. So several different verses can abrogate a previous single verse. And one verse can abrogate more than one ruling. For instance, verse 9.5, which we'll get to as we go, Quran 9.5 abrogates approximately 184 Quran verses. Now, I just threw this in as a technical point. It's not really critical for us, but Nasik is not Tartsis. And just to make that clear, and I'll get to the source of all of this in a minute. So further detail in the definition of Nasik. It can also mean to transcribe or to copy. For instance, a scribe is called a Nasik. Now, abrogation implies that the first ruling has been completely repealed. So it's not comparable to Tartsis, nor is it initiation or Bada. I just bring this up just in case someone in the comments decides to say, oh, when you've got this wrong, because I'm quoting from an authoritative source here, um, and I'll get to what that source is. But that's just in case that comes up and someone says, well, you know, we don't know what we're talking about. So a law with no previous precedent is Bada, and Nask means that there must have existed a previous ruling. Nask is valid in terms of Islamic law or fiqh, but not the fundamental six articles of Islamic belief or Aqidah. So just so we know, the six Sunni articles of belief are belief in Allah and Tawhid, which is their version of monotheism, belief in the angels, belief in the Islamic holy books, not book, belief in the prophets and messengers, belief in the last judgment and the resurrection, and belief in predestination. Right. I, I'm not going to go into, into more detail on this, but they all the first five are based on Quranic creeds. So, uh, yeah, so, so those are what the Islamic belief is, the Akidah. But now, Nasik applies to law and Tafsir. Now, last time we had a show two weeks ago, we discussed that there are two different kinds of Tafsir. Did I, was that on your show, that is? We discussed that there are actually... Uh, yeah, I think so. I think so. Two yeah. separate types of Tafsir. We only know the ones that are based on literal applications of the law, but there's also the allegorical, which is the application to the mystical meanings of Islam. And, um, but let's not get into that now. That's a discussion which which best for another day. But what is important here is that, so there's a concept called mafhum, the way a verse is understood can be abrogated. So the explicit wording, in other words, the words in the page do not change, but the way that the verse is understood is reinterpreted by the scholars to mean something completely different than what the words on the page say. But the layman doesn't know this, only the scholars know this. Your thoughts? Yeah, it's, a, it's pretty interesting. Um, I think that that definitely ties into what we talked about last time about how Islam's all based on legal wording and technicalities and stuff like that. So you can have the clear meaning of the verse, but uh, that's, that meaning is no longer valid, but it's okay because it, we can technically say that it still means something else. Yeah, well, they can throw it at you because you don't know that it's actually, that's just the mantuk, it's no longer the mafum. So the wording could be, um, you know, thou shalt not kill, but the mafum is that it's now understood differently to mean 
thou shalt not kill if it's the 1st of November, but every other day in the year is just fine. You know, so, so that, that's what the mafhum would be, that the way the verse is understood can be abrogated. So that, that understanding is abrogated. And uh, one will only know this, of course, if you're a scholar and if you go start to read the scholarly legal books. So now, just briefly, the same practice to some well, degree. Hold on, is, before, before yeah. you go on, uh, Muhammad Amin has a comment that is kind of interesting. He says, abrogation in the Quran is like a pharmacist who changes the medicine to the sick guy. If the medicine not work with gut, the doctor changes the medicine, same thing in Islam. Now, I think that this is very interesting because he is comparing Allah, who supposedly is all knowing, to a human doctor who doesn't know the medicine and has to experiment. So he's saying Allah is experimenting with wording to try to find the right wording. Uh, that's a very interesting concept of God you, you got there. I, I don't think well, you wanted to say that. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd love him to give us his source references because it seems to be coming from the Zakir Naik Bible or the uh, Muhammad Amin version of the Sharia. But fine. I mean, that's your opinion. Thank you. So now the same practice is present in Judaism, and no, he's wrong. So laws, so newer laws in Judaism also can abrogate older Judaic law. This is analogous or similar to, but not identical to the day of the Christian Reformation. But also within the Torah, we have different covenants. There are four major covenants in the Bible. The first one is the covenant of Noah, known, in, known infamously as the laws of Noah which people are hysterical about. Secondly, you have the covenant with Abraham, then you have the covenant with David, then you have the covenant with Jesus, which is the New Testament, the New Covenant. So these covenants changed over time. Some of the portions remained carried through and some things changed. So, but this is like having a contract and you end the contract, you have a new contract and now you have new agreements. That's how, what happens biblically, but in Islam, it's just sort of today, Muhammad said this, tomorrow he says that, what the hell do we do now? How do we figure out this mess? And, and that's what abrogation is. So the difference is Islam adopted jihad. Jihad abrogated everything. So there are people who lie about the Jews and the people in the Talmud deliberately avoid all of these points that even the Jewish law has had its reformation. So we are told within the and I'll get to the source in a minute, that the scholars tell us, the Islamic scholars, and when I say scholars, I mean legal scholars, lawyers, they tell us personal opinion or personal reasoning is not valid. So a Nasik ruling must be scriptural. It must be based on either the Quran or based on the Sunnah, the Adit. Personal reasoning, ijtihad, or analogy, kiyas, cannot abrogate a ruling in Quran or Sunnah that must have been said by Allah, or by Muhammad. Yep, that is. Oh, yep, very good. Uh, we have a, a insightful comment from Built for Speed. He says, abrogation in Islam is like an individual manipulating the previous roles and changing them to fit their own beliefs. And I think that that also ties in a lot with what we said last week, where um, if, if you have enough knowledge about the law, you can manipulate the law to fit your own purposes. Well, we discussed Hiel, and Hiel is literally that, as, as Built for Speed 101 described, Hiel is literally altering and breaking every single law, manipulating every single Sharia law for your own benefit. That is precisely the case. And Amin says, if I bring you a source from a Sharia, will you admit that you're a liar? Well, I'm, <laughs> uh, dude, you haven't yet brought us a Sharia source. So now, a Mansik ruling must precede the Nasik ruling in time. It must come afterwards in time. Nasik can only occur in the lifetime of Muhammad. After his death, no new Quran rulings or Sunnah can be revealed. Nasik is primarily a Medinan Quran phenomenon. So the Quran is divided into, or Islam is divided into its early and late periods from Mecca. And then Muhammad made the Hijra to Medina, which marked the year zero in Islam. So that's the immigration. And at this stage, the laws of Islam were finalized. Okay, so this was in Medina. Nasq was first strictly applied to abrogation by Imam Shafi, who, of the Shafi School of Jurisprudence. And he wrote about it in the famous Usul al fiqh treatise, al risala however you pronounce that. And he died in 820 AD. So 
if we want to learn about Nasq, this was something that was started by the top scholars in Islam, and it's now become law. Um, so, usul al fiqh to know what we do. What usul al fiqh is the principles of jurisprudence, and the principles of jurisprudence is the study of the rules to be used in deducing the Islamic laws. It teaches us the correct and valid way of deducing from the relative relevant sources in jurisprudence. So that that is what that refers to. Any comments or questions so far? Sorry, as I'm mute there. Uh, no, I don't have anything to add. Uh, Sonia, do you have anything at this point? Well, even Islam Q and A agree that um, yeah, the, the Quranic verses can be abrogated by the Sharia. So I'm going to yeah. be very interested to see this presentation as it develops. So if um, Muhammad Amin is unsure, he can always go to Islam Q and A and yeah, have true. a look and see what they actually say about this. You know, the great scholar Muhammad Amin. So. So far, I've been quoting from this man's book. You'll know this guy here, Yasser Qadi. Um, he did not learn his Islam on the internet in the YouTube comment section. He actually went to Saudi Arabia to Medina University and studied there for several years. So clearly that means he's underqualified. He's got nowhere near the qualifications of Muhammad Amin who learned his Islam on the back of, I don't know, you know, cardboard boxes in, in Hyderabad or something. So anyway, so the book is called An Introduction to the Sciences of the Quran by Abu Ahmad Yasul Qadi. And he references the earliest books. He says, without a doubt, the most thorough discussion of the topic of Nask written in this era is the book An Nask Fi Al Quran by Dr. Mustafa Zaid, if you want to look that up. And there's also another excellent work. He mentions Al Ayat Al Mansukha Fi Al Quran by Dr. Abdullah Ibn Muhammad, whatever. You read that later, you come back and check the video. So these are the, the great scholars that have written some definitive works on this. He's simply quoting this. <clears throat> so let me go on. However, from his book, we'll see the following. Both the Nasik and the Mansik rulings must originate in the Quran or the Sunnah. And notice this here is actually italicized. It's actually emphasized. This is because analogy and reasoning cannot abrogate the command from Allah or the Prophet. So in other words, your thoughts, your weak thoughts, Muhammad Amin, are not sufficient to overrule the words of Allah or Muhammad. As for the consensus, the ijma, it is not possible for ijma to occur against an explicit command in the Quran or the Sunnah. The ijma is effectively what we call the Sharia, right? It is the consensus of all the major scholars of Islam. Therefore, this also cannot be the source of Nasik Mansik rulings. In other words, only Allah has the right to abrogate any command that originated from him, either in the Quran or through the tongue of his prophet. That means the Hadith. So the book is called, as I said, an introduction to the sciences of the Quran. And let's have a look from page 238. Nask can only occur within the Quran and Sunnah. The Nasik ruling can come from Quran and Sunnah. And the Mansuk can only be found in the Quran or Sunnah. And they mention here four types of abrogation. The Quran abrogates the Quran. The Quran abrogates the Sunnah. The Sunnah abrogates the Quran. And the Sunnah abrogates the Sunnah. Older Hadith are abrogated by newer Hadith. But newer Hadith also can abrogate the Quran. I think that that question has come up before. And this now confirms it. And I'll provide many other sources that say the same thing. Excellent. Uh, I think that we as Christians have a hard time getting our mind around this because it's just so different than what we expect. We, we, you know, the Bible's our authority. So we automatically assume that the Quran has the same status in Islam, which I mean, it does to a certain extent, but yeah. not really because the Hadith are on the same authority and the Quran is vague and the Hadith generally are not so vague. So the Hadith often override the most obvious reading of the Quran because it's vague enough to allow for multiple readings. And they supposedly come from Muhammad and he's the best interpreter of the Quran. So really the Hadith are the highest authority. True. And if you read the Sharia, it constantly refers to the Quran and the Sunnah in its correct context. It gives us the actual final meaning and the final ruling as to what those words mean. And it, and it tells us, um, exactly what is still relevant and what is no longer relevant. So let's have a look. The Warakat, 
by it's a book on uh, Usul al fiqh as well by Imam al Armain of Juwaini. It's a classical manual of jurisprudence, and it tells us here under the section on abrogation. Another wonderful manual here by a major scholar, not by an internet scholar. Nask means removal or to cause to pass away, right? And in terms of a sul, it's defined as the removal of a ruling established by a previous address. So something that's been spoken is now removed by a new address that replaces. So very bluntly then, we've got another major scholar of Islam and we can look this guy up and see if he's a Mickey Mouse scholar like like uh, Muhammad Amin, or if this is a legitimate, highly regarded, highly respected Islamic scholar who's who had a strong influence on the creation of Islamic law. And it very clearly it says here, technically, abrogation means to remove a legal ruling or its wording with another evidence from the Quran and the Sunnah. I think that's pretty clear here at the bottom. So abrogation means to remove a legal ruling which means that the Quran and the Sunnah provide legal rulings. The, the Hadith are actually legal rulings, not just stories for the entertainment of little children, but or to maybe frighten them to, into behaving for, correctly, but actually law and, yeah, and many of those were abrogated. Comments? Uh, yeah, we have an interesting question here from Q0W1E, et cetera. Um, he says that if Muslims aren't challenged by saying their books are false, how can we catch them as being hypocrites um, when they admit their books are false or, you know, he referring to abrogation? Um, you know, look, they're going to lie anyway, because, I mean, you know, it's just that's how it goes. But the fact is that we have the knowledge now to challenge them, to provide the facts, to provide the resources. And so we can be very, very detailed and very specific. And I think just the weight of the evidence already puts them on the back foot and it prevents them from deceiving others because we can put the evidence out there and we can wake people up and we can challenge and argue against them because they don't have much to go against this. I mean, these are the facts from the top scholars. Muhammad Amin is nobody. I mean, quite bluntly, he's nobody. He has no right to even have an opinion on Islam. You know, I'm referencing the absolutely most senior scholars in Islam from their most senior books, or at least the most authoritative books. Uh, to, to Amin's credit, he did say that the things you are saying, I admit this, I'm not sure which things precisely, but apparently he's saying that he agrees that well, with what we're teaching about abrogation. So I'll give him credit for that. Yeah, for once. I mean, otherwise he's gonna have to tell us that this is all lies and then he's gonna have to explain to us how every single senior scholar here and every book here is false. You know, that, that's fact. I mean, something we discussed earlier in the week was, um, I mean, Islam is the only religion where its followers deny the Quran, deny the Sirah, deny the Hadith, deny the Tafsir, deny the Sharia to defend it. You're like, what the hell? You know, they will deny anything and everything to, to try to defend Islam. Uh, anything from you, Sonia? You're very quiet there in the corner. Yeah, I'm seeing they're typing away <clears throat> and looking at the context of what Muhammad Amin was, um, he was using the book of Hebrews, talking about the priesthood, but he doesn't understand that the fact that Muhammad comes along and claims he's a prophet of the Old Testament in the line of the prophets, calling himself the seal of the prophets. What did Muhammad actually come to bring? What did Muhammad, Muhammad Amin, come to offer Christianity? if he was considered the seal of the prophets. You want to talk about abrogation? Well, show me from the Quranic text, what did Islam come to offer? Stop the lying, stop this diversion mm. tactic, because we understand very clearly from your own sources what Islam is and who actually has the right and the authority to say what it is, not you. You don't have no credentials to make that statement. We understand that the Mosaic Covenant, the Old Covenant, if you like, was, as it says in the book of Hebrews, chapter 8, verse uh, 13, that the Old Covenant was made obsolete by the New Covenant. But that New Covenant was made in the blood, and the blood was the blood of Jesus Christ. Islam does no way abrogate that. 
You need to understand what abrogation is according to your own Islamic definitions. And do not go back to the Bible because you're you're proving the very point that Lloyd is making in this presentation, how Islam considers itself to be abrogating the beliefs of the Bible. So, of course, we don't believe what you believe. We are here to expose that ab abrogation law. And you need to get a notepad, take some notes and take it back to your scholars, to your imams and to your clerics, and then come here and put those quotes in this comment section. Because you yeah. don't have no validity. You, your comments hold no weight. You're not the authority on Islam, are you? No, he's not. Um, he's even laughing about the Encyclopedia of Islam. As I showed two weeks ago, it costs $36,000 to buy this book. And you still have to pay over $1,000 a year for maintenance. Or you can rent mm -hmm. it at the wonderful price of, what, three, four, four $4,000 a month? And... Um, you know, he'd have to point out to us how exactly it's false because it's written. He he posted some really interesting stuff about it. it's all it's all non-Muslim names, and the the passage that he was critiquing that I that I had on screen was actually written by a Muslim. You know, which he missed. But what's interesting is that he's got to show us how it's false. It's like saying, "Oh, Wikipedia is false." Well, if if Wikipedia writes an article about me and it's got the facts are correct, is it immediately false just because it's on Wikipedia? Well, he's got to show us why, because those, those Encyclopedia of Islam articles are used at universities across the world, even in Islamic universities, because it is the gold standard in reference works for Islam. And it references all of these works and all of these scholars. So, yeah, um, I mean, he's just trying to, well, yeah, he's got nothing. Moving on. Um, uh, well, real quick before you do, I just wanted to say that uh, attacking a source instead of the material is a formal logical fallacy. It's called the genetic fallacy. So unless you want us to think that Islam is the religion that denies logic, uh, don't do that. Yeah. yeah, Islam doesn't consider logic, right? They don't have logic and reason. True. And yeah, only within the confines of the Sharia because the Sharia automatically overrules anything that, that you know, would contradict it. So notice that it says here that um, Joani says, abrogating is acceptable intellectually and is a legal Sharia reality. So it's not me saying this, this is one of the top scholars of Islam in one of the most authoritative legal books in Islam. Remember, we showed last time, Islam's a legal system. It's priests are lawyers, when they say scholar of Islam, they mean legal scholar. Just make a note of that. Lawyers and religion run by lawyers. So abrogation, again, in the water cut, it is possible for the Quran to be abrogated by the Quran and the Sunnah to be abrogated by the Quran. So what is collectively transmitted can be abrogated by what is collectively transmitted. What is individually transmitted can be abrogated by what is individually or collectively transmitted and blah, blah, bunch of rules. So blah, blah, blah. So they give us some rules in. So they actually are a set of rules that the scholars work with. But I wanted to point out that even in the thick, the jurisprudence, it's, it's a reality and they discuss all of the implications. <clears throat> but notice when the wording has been abrogated, but the ruling remains, such as the abrogation of the verse, which speaks of the five breast eatings by which the relationship of Maham is established between the infant and the woman who breastfeeds him or her. Yeah, okay, so abrogation is real. What has been abrogated both in wording as well as ruling, such as the abrogation of the 10 breastfeedings in the previous narration of Aisha, where a man who wanted, who needed to be alone with an, an adult male, who needed to be alone with an adult female, she had to expose her breasts to him, have him suck on her nipples 10 times. This would make him her de facto child and would remove apparently any and all sexual feelings so that they would not have illicit sex and break the law. Yeah, whatever. Um, Islam for the win. Uh, yeah, next next slide. Try and get those images out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Revelation has mentioned that this religious community is divinely protected from error. They believe that they cannot make any mistakes and that Allah has intervened to cancel and correct any and all mistakes. Now, notice it says here, and obviously this is by a man who's obviously has no idea what Islam is about. 
scholarly consensus is binding on subsequent generations, regardless of when the consensus occurred. The correct position is that the generational demise is not a condition, right? So, uh, let's see. Okay, scholarly consensus can be established by their statements. This is by Mushtahid here, by the actions or by the statements or actions of some when the statements or actions are well known and others remain silent. So the Wadakat, okay, the Usul al Fiqh is a primer on the fundamentals of Islamic jurisprudence by Imam al Haramain al Juwaini. So the purpose of the text is to introduce students to the source methodology of Muslim scholars in deriving rules from the Quran and Sunnah. So it's a text that teaches Islamic jurists, Islamic scholars. So he was a Persian, he was a Sunni, Shafi jurist, and he was a Mutakalam theologian, whatever that means. And uh, yeah, so he was a very, very senior scholar, and he was, it's, he was a distinguished Islamic philosopher, jurist, and apparently scientist. So let's look at scholarly consensus. The scholarly consensus, remember the ijma is the ultimate um, source of law in Islam. That's the, sense, the scholarly consensus of all of the um, jurists in Islam. It is the agreement of the scholars of a generation on the rulings of an occurrence. By scholars, we mean scholars of the sacred law. So we, we picked this up last week. They always say we have to talk to a scholar. Well, this man's a scholar. And when they say scholar, as I was pointing out two weeks ago, lawyer. Scholars of law are lawyers. And by occurrence, we mean an occurrence that relates to sacred law, not religious stuff, not holy stuff, legal stuff, lawyers doing lawyer stuff. The consensus of this community and no other is an authoritative proof. The consensus of this community and no other is an authoritative proof because the prophet has said, my community does not agree upon an error. So Saeed's always telling us that no, Aisha was not nine years old when Muhammad got on top of her. She was 4,322 years old and could legally have sex. No, no, no. You're, you are then contradicting, you're, you're an apostate. Any comments there? Uh, not directly on that, um, but uh, Muhammad Amin just said, I challenge a proud, Christ, proud Christian man to respond to me on this. And I'm gonna encourage everyone in the chat to ignore his attempts to distract and change the subject. Uh, if he continues to do that, I will have to block him again. Uh, we've already explained. I mean, those were covenants that changed. Those are like legal contracts. I mean, once they expire, a new one is created. It's not like Muhammad today, yeah, we, we don't have child sex. Oh, we do have child sex now. Now things change. So again, um, I think our final slide on this guy, on the water cut, among the prerequisites of a mushtahid, this is someone who knows the law, someone who gives fatwa, is that it is not permissible for anybody to give Islamic legal opinion, fatwa, who is not well-versed in the Quran and is well acquainted with the science of abrogation. So for someone to become a Qadi, an Islamic legal judge, you have to know abrogation. And for someone to give fatwa, you must know abrogation. So the question is, why does a scholar have to spend five years, a minimum of five years in, um, in Medina or five years at um, Al-Azhar learning this stuff when they could just have asked Muhammad Amin, they could have just gone to the YouTube comment section and said, Amin, can you, uh, can you, can you take over all of the legal stuff in Islam for us because you know best? Yeah, um, so abrogation and Sharia, Islamic supremacy. So it also says here, this is in the Sharia, the Alliance of the Traveler, the world's most common, most popular, most famous Sharia manual. And it says, this section has been translated to clarify possible confusion among Muslims as to Islam's place among world religions. Previously revealed religions were valid in their own eras, but were abrogated by Islam. So all other religions, all other religions were abrogated by Islam. So there are erroneous theories affirming these religions validity, but they deny or they do not mention their abrogation. They don't mention that these religions were all abrogated, that it is unbelief, kufr, a crime in Islam, punishable by death, to hold that the remnant cults, the remnant cults now bearing the names of formerly valid religions, such as Christianity, quote unquote, or Judaism, quote unquote, are acceptable to Allah after he sent 
the final messenger. This is a matter of which there is no disagreement among Islamic scholars. Islam is the final religion that Allah will never abrogate. Any comments? <clears throat> Uh, no, not directly on it. I did put I'm in and time out. Well, but any comments for you guys? I mean, anything <laughs> that you want to say? Oh, yeah. Uh, Sonia, you have any thoughts? Well, what does Islam actually abrogate? This is what I was going back to, and I was, I'm waiting for Muhammad Amin to leave a comment. So oh. we got the priesthood that he had an issue with, that, oh, the priesthood is not abrogated. All right, then what did Islam introduce? Pagan, lawyers. stone, it, it, idolatry, it introduced worship. lawyers. Kissing a blinking black stone in the middle of nowhere. Is that what Islam is? Is that it? Is yeah. that what it came to do? You know, it came to do away with the beautiful covenants, especially the new covenant, which was done in the blood of Jesus. And what, to kiss a black stone? That's it? That is what Islam has to offer me? Really? Yeah, pretty much. So, yeah. So now we've got Ghazali, who was the number one Muslim after is the number one scholar of Islam. This is the man that created the Islamic consensus after Muhammad. Now, we should note that he was a Sufi. And we should also note that Sufism is not a sect of Islam. It is a, um, oh, what's the word now, Thaddeus? I forgot. It is a religious order. It is not a sect. It is not, a, it is not like Sunni or Shia. It's not a sect. It's not. So anyone can belong to the Sufi. And he was a Sufi. And Sufism is heavily discussed in the Sharia. Sufism is regarded in the Sharia by numerous scholars as integral, critical to Islam. This is something that's going to annoy people when I get around to that, but it is fact and you have to deal with it. So Imam Hamad, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali is perhaps the most eminent Muslim thinker, scholar, practitioner, mystic, and philosopher of Islam. He is unanimously accepted as the 5th century centennial renovator of religion of the Hijri Mujahideen. His works were so highly acclaimed by his contemporaries that he was the only Muslim in history to be called the Hujat al-Islam, Islam's foremost authority, or the proof of Islam, or its decisive argument, which became his most known surname. A Mujahideen, or renewal of the faith according to the prophetic hadith, appears only once every century to restore the faith of the Islamic community. Al-Ghazali, in his various works, refuted the philosophy of Ibn Sina and demonstrated that Aristotelian ethics is incompatible with Islamic ethics. So we're talking that Aristotelian logic or what we today just call logic is incompatible with Islam. Well, there you go. Earlier I was saying, you don't want us to think that Islam is the religion that's against logic, but apparently it is, so. Yeah. The incoherence of the philosophers, this book he mentions here, this, the incoherence of the philosophers, he went against all of the, the philosophers that were starting to adopt Western philosophy from Aristotle. And um, he basically said, no, the Sharia is the ultimate law and uh, your, your reason is overruled by Sharia. Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, when you really study um, the Quran, the Hadith, whatever, carefully, as this uh, scholar no doubt did, you come to the conclusion that it's incompatible with a lot of things. It's incompatible with uh, what we know about from science. It's incompatible with logic. It's incompatible with uh, normal ethics, all kinds of things. So your choices basically are to reject all those things, which is uh, the track the scholars take, or you can reject Islam. Which is the track I take. Same. Oh, on this point, I just want to mention um, someone who was in the chat the last show actually came on my channel and actually on a different channel, I was posting comments. And he actually, this is very weird. And I, I found this very weird and disturbing, but he was, he came and he posted very slyly, very snarkily. He said, um, this was this guy from Holland who mentioned that Islam is taking over Holland. And he said, um, Lloyd, the Muslims reading your comments will think that they, because I was just posting these verses that were contradicting things Muslims were saying, but I wasn't adding any exposition to most of them. I was just posting the verses, which basically highlighted this is what Islam believes. And these are from authoritative sources of Korea. And he was saying that, that basically they will believe that I am a, a convert to Islam and that I am promoting Islam and that they have 
they have someone who's a great ally of theirs. And uh, isn't it very suspicious, Lloyd, that, that you're posting these things that seem so supportive of Islam? And um, there's, there's a couple of words that, that I, could, I could say, man, but uh, not live, not in a family oriented show. <coughs> There's a comment, you guys. Bad yes, the Lloyd. Uh, one of the commenters called Dashing Rogue wrote, I could just imagine the Muslims reenacting the opening scene with the Black Stone from 2001 A Space Odyssey, except they never get into space. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Good point, Dashing. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So, Ghazali yeah, wrote in Muhammad's Quranic errors, Al Ghazali's words that the Prophet that the prophets are not immune to errors in judgment. These are not my words. These are the scholars of Islam. Ghazali wrote in his whatever the book, whatever the hell you say that, he says under the name Deliverance from Error on page 73, introduced by blah, blah, he says the prophets and the religious leaders referred men to exercise of personal judgment and necessarily so, despite their knowledge that men might make mistakes. The apostle of Allah, Allah's blessings and peace be upon him, even said, I judge by externals, but Allah undertakes to judge the hearts of men. This means I judge according to the most probable opinion resulting from witness statements, but they may be wrong about the matter. The prophets had no way to be safe from error in such cases involving personal judgments. And this includes Muhammad. How then can anyone else aspire to such safety? So comment, Al-Ghazali wrote this in refutation of blah 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 who says that there must be an infallible imam at every time to know the truth al-ghazali explained that the prophet used his personal judgment in judging between people but yet he was not free from error ghazali said that muhammad was not free from error al-ghazali explained these matters in detail that the prophet can make errors in judgment so well, hold on. Zali tells us, and this is scholarly agreement, this is the Ijma, that Muhammad and the, all the prophets can make, because they're human, can make errors in judgment. And thus, it goes on. So Al-Buti is quoting these people on the prophets' errors in judgment, like for the case of the prisoners of Badr. They use this example where he released them for the sum of money, but that was unfortunately contrary to the will of Allah. The revelation, then came the revelation of Quranic verses reprimanding the prophet and his companions for this decision. This points to important principles. The event serves as evidence that the prophet possessed the right to engage in those blah, okay, blah, blah, blah. So rather, a Quranic verse would inevitably, okay, look, let me take it from here. However, in those cases where Muhammad's judgment was incorrect, the error would not be allowed to remain. Rather, a Quranic verse would inevitably be revealed in order to correct Muhammad's mistaken judgment. If no such verse was revealed following the judgment, this indicated that Muhammad's judgment had been correct in accordance with the truth as known by Allah. So Allah had to correct Muhammad's mistakes by sending new verses. Those are the abrogations. So this is very interesting because Muslims tell us that um, Muhammad is perfect and he can't make any mistakes. And they make fun of Christians because our understanding of prophets is that they're human beings and they can make mistakes. So are you telling me that the average Muslim who claims that Muhammad couldn't make any mistakes doesn't know their religion very well or is lying or both? All of the above. However, it does say in the Sharia that it is illegal. It is actually blasphemy and apostasy for a Muslim to not believe that Muhammad was perfect. So perfect and made mistakes. That's an interesting combination. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, the perfect maker of mistakes. Yeah. It, it, yeah. You worked that out. So, um, so we are more than halfway. So the Encyclopedia of Islam Volume 13, page 442, and I provided links to those. If you go to my channel, you'll find links to all of this. Nasik. So an abrogator. Nasik wa mansuk is the act of cancellation or abrogation. And it says here, and this is in the science of tradition, which is the hadith, and in law. And is the generic label for a range of theories concerning verses and traditions, hadith, which when compared suggest 
frequent serious conflict. So we have frequent serious conflict within the Islamic sources. So the traditions of Hadith, Hadiths are abrogated by newer ones, just like Quran verses. And we also learn that many older laws have been abrogated. So now let's have a look. So it says here under mask, right? A comparison of verse with verse, Hadith with Hadith, Hadith with verse, that's Quran verse, and both Quran and Hadith with the law suggest frequent serious conflict, right? So there was a gradual development in the details of the regulations introduced in the, both the, the Quran and the Sunnah. Nask applies to each of the two sources, Quran and Sunnah, and to the relations between them. Nask of the Quran by the Quran, abrogation of Hadith by Hadith, the abrogation of Quran by Hadith and of Hadith by Quran raised more delicate issues which divided the scholars. And it tells us in this instance of Nask in the Hadith, a later regulation has replaced an earlier practice. So we learn here that the abrogation applies to Quran verses and to Hadith. And these Hadith were the basis of the law and many of these laws are not abrogated. Islam's in a perpetual state of confusion, isn't it? It wants to keep its people in confusion while the guys at the top of their pyramid, the Islamic pyramid, can make the decisions according to however they see fit. Well, remember, there's the four levels of understanding in Islam and your average Muslim like Muhammad Amin and Syed are at the bottom level, which is the level for the masses. And then, of course, you have the higher levels for the scholars and for the Sufis. How convenient. That's yeah. why the, the world, the Islamic world is in the state that it is today. Is it any wonder? Yeah, I mean, I, I covered this last time in the, in the last show. If people go back and I covered some of that, specifically the four levels of understanding. So let's have a look. Um, so in Quran 2, 180, the Muslims make testamentary provision for parents and the nearest kin was thought to have been revoked on the revelation of 4, 10 to 11. So that's Surah 4 verses 10 to 11. So many verses counsel patience in the face of the mockery of the unbelievers, while other verses incite to warfare against unbelievers. The former are linked to the Meccan phase of the Islamic mission, when the Muslims were too few and too weak to do other than endure insults. The latter are linked to Medina, where the Prophet had acquired the numbers and the strength to hit back. The discrepancy between the two sets of verses indicate that different situations call for different regulations. So there is no absolute morality. There is no absolute law. It's whatever is convenient in the moment. This is an instance of Nask in the Quran. Chronology is the key to the resolution of the difference since a divine book can obtain contradictions. So the contradictions exist. This is simply their way of papering over, trying to explain the contradictions. So Nask is change or replacement. So they speak of here, the last two of which appear to suggest the possibility of Muhammad's forgetting revelations. So uh, we talk of events in the life of the prophet consolidated the notion of his forgetting. That's why new verses were sent down. Yeah, uh, there are a number of hadith who talk about that talk about Muhammad forgetting verses, Muslims forgetting verses, so on. And yeah, we're told today that the Quran has been perfectly preserved because of the perfect memories of these people. And it's like, uh, there you go, contradicting your own sources again. Muhammad yes. forgot things, he had to be reminded. Yep. Oh, by the way, there's a guy called I'm a medical doctor in the comments. He was in a comment, he was on a thread last week on YouTube, and some guy said, Oh, when 9.5 says, um, you know, fight those amongst the people of the book who do not believe in Allah in the last day, someone said, no, they don't mean fight all the people, all the Christians and Jews, just those amongst the Christians and the Jews who don't believe in Allah. Well, first of all, <laughs> medical doctor, Christians and Jews do not believe in Allah. And when they're saying those amongst, how do you know who in your church doesn't believe in you know, how do you point out the ones that, that don't believe in Allah? Well, all of them don't, so they fight all of them. And I thought this was an incredible level of stupidity. And he was actually buying into a lie being told to him by a Muslim. And, you know, I just I just found this to be incredible. So, so look, man, do some reading, do some learning, but, but please just lay off the stupidity. 
sorry about that. That just really upset me because um, anyway, so abrogation, the evolution of fiqh. So this is from the book, The Evolution of Fiqh, Islamic Law and the Madhabs by Abu Amina Bilal Phillips, very, very well-known authority of Islam. And they speak of abrogated, things were abrogated. And when things are abrogated in the Nasq, its validity becomes canceled. It doesn't become an option, it's canceled. Abrogation is cancellation, right? Because its unique purpose may have been achieved. So the law, the need for the law ceases to exist. And notice there are many such examples to be found in the Quran and the Sunnah, not just the Quran. Second one, they mention here, if any of your women are guilty of sex crimes, take the evidence of four witnesses from you against them. And if they testify, and if two men of you are guilty of sex crimes, punish them both. But if they repent, blah, blah, blah. This law was abrogated by the setting of a particularly exemplary punishment. Flog the woman and the man guilty of fornication, 100 lashes. And they often die of this. If you believe in Allah and the last day, do not let compassion move you in their case. For it is a matter decided by Allah that they should be tortured to death. Let a group of believers witness the punishment. Furthermore, the prophet applied the punishment of stoning to death for those who committed adultery and set the death penalty for homosexuals without specifying the method. So I don't know why the gay lobby is so pro-Islam. It's like, what the hell? <laughs> so a review of the abrogated verses indicates that the early law may be replaced by a more severe law as in the case of the law for fornication, which changed from confinement and punishment to lashes or stoning to death. And here are the sources that are provided. And it's from this book here. You guys are welcome to look it up. I can give you the links to all of this stuff. So Bilal Phillips, um, he was born, well, he converted to Islam in 72, received a Bachelor of Arts degree from the Islamic University of Medina and an MA in Akida Islamic Theology from King Saud University in Riyadh then went to the University of Wales, where he completed a PhD in Islamic theology. So he comes from a family of educators, and the Islamic online university is the brainchild of Bilal Phillips. So if you don't like what I'm saying here, go have a chat with this guy. <clears throat> um, yeah, next one. So <clears throat> further sources, as you can see, Quran abrogates Sunnah, but Sunnah also abrogates Quran. And the same is mentioned in Islam Q&A. How can we know which hadiths were abrogated and which abrogated others? And they, they, they answer this question. And yes, hadiths are also abrogated. So often when Muslims are giving you, but this hadith, bugger that hadith, who cares? That, that hadith is also mansuk. Just like those Quran verses on mansuk, they're all abrogated, forget them. They're, they're, they, they, they're canceled. The newer one, the worst one is the right one. They're lying to you. Again, so now we've got this, the Hadaya of Marganani. This is the most famous um, Hanafi um, Sharia manual. It's the Hanafi. This is the most famous Hanafi Sharia manual. Just like the Reliance of the Traveler is the most common, most popular Sharia manual, but it was written by the Shafis, but it's become the most popular one in the world. This one is four, I've got four volumes of this. So it's several thousand pages. It's really detailed. Like the chapter on jihad is like, I don't know, 60, 70 pages. It's really detailed. And they speak of abrogated, abrogated, abrogated the books that preceded it. So like the Quran is abrogated by later traditions. So hadith supplied the abrogated, abrogated the, the, the guidance. I mean, so <laughs> this is an 800 year old volume used by Muslim jurists to issue Islamic law rulings. And arguably the most widely book of Islamic law in the Muslim world. And it's used as a primary text in Islamic schools and seminaries. Again, if you have a problem, take it up with these dudes, not with me. The Sharia says that all other religions are abrogated. So they speak of that they abrogated all previous religious systems with the prophet's sacred law, with a sacred religious system headed up by the sacred lawyers for Allah. So yeah, that's when the imam is a lawyer. And so, yeah, basically, Sharia says that it has abrogated all other systems of religion, but it is a, is a legal system, and it, therefore, it, it seems to think some of the Christianity is a legal system. Comments from you guys, because we're busy getting to the last few slides. 
Yeah, um, Islam does abrogate the Bible. It does. There's um, an article. It's very old, however. It's from 1999, and it's on Islamic Awareness page and this letter written and it starts off it begins with islam abrogates all the previous religions christianity and judaism included and hence if the jews and christians do not accept islam they are the losers this is some imam writing this thing whatever good deeds they have will be scattered just like dust on the day of judgment we will not only quote the islamic position on this issue we will also re refer to the reliance of the traveler a book of Islamic jurisprudence we read. Previously revealed religions were valid in their own areas as is attested by many verses of the Holy Quran, but were abrogated by the universal yeah. message of Islam. Yeah, as that, is that's right here in Hebrew. section W4 of the yeah, Sharia. Yeah, it's the same I mentioned one. it earlier. Oh, bugger. Here it is. This is from section W4 in the Reliance of the Traveler. The so that's one. what he's quoting. That's the Sharia. Yeah. This is the most popular <laughs> Sharia manual in the, in the world. What do they say to that? Why why are they beating around the bush? Come on, be forthright, you guys. Honesty is not part of Islam. So notice that they mention here biblical religions are abrogated. So under section 0, 08.7 in the in the Sharia manual, acts that entail leaving Islam. Among the things that entail apostasy are number 20, to deny that Allah intended the Prophet's message to be the religion followed by the entire world. So to you be your religion has been abrogated. <clears throat> Quran 2, 256 that I started with has been abrogated. It is apostasy for a Muslim to say, well, you know, it's okay. You've got your religion. I've got mine. Or, you know, you, you, you do your thing. I'll do my thing. <laughs> to deny this is apostasy and means you are guilty of apostasy. You've left Islam. Actually, oh. Islam. And it, it says the faith dialogue. Yeah, the, the, there is no discussion. The Sharia is the final word. There is no debating it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, this tolerance thing is just something that we're taught in the West um, where Muslims are weak and they can't enforce their will. In the Middle East, there's no, or North Africa or anywhere else where Islam is dominant, there's no. Uh, pretending that Islam is tolerant of other religions. They're quite open. Yeah. It's, it's definitely not tolerant. I mean, Amin just said something stupid, like popular Sharia man in the world. If it's not, why don't you tell us which one is? Because you can't, right? Because Muslims cannot talk about the Sharia because you're ashamed of this Sharia. Sorry, the diarrhea laws in these diarrhea manuals. You guys can't talk about it, right? It's a big secret because if the world knew about it, They'd like burn all of these damn books. So anyway, but it notice also it says there are others for the subject is nearly limitless, you know, apostasy. So also the laws of Sharia, according to the school of Imam Shafi, it says this book is suitable for a Muslim, whether he, he or she is an ordinary householder, worshiper, a spouse concerned with marriage, divorce or maintenance, or an administrator of what, a testator, a trader, a cultivator, a joint stockholder, a lawyer, a judge, an employee, and an employer, an employee, a trustee, or a student of commerce, a donor of gifts, or a guardian. And it, this, this book quotes all of the top scholars from uh, Tamiya to Nawawi and others. So this book is regarded because it's a single volume, right? It's one volume, and thus it is considered um, such a popular Sharia man. He's the most commonly sold. He's the most sold, the most bought, the most owned. Um, but maybe Muhammad, the first Sharia man was the Quran. <coughs> so... Um, no, because the Quran is unfortunately 12 pages long now after it's been abrogated. So the Quran is basically, um, I don't know, it's like, you know, it's its like the width of two dull bulls stacked on top of each other after all the abrogation was done. So Sharia, religion must conform to Sharia. So according to the Sharia, all religion must conform to the Sharia. That's convenient. So the abrogation of previously revealed religion, section W4.3. So any Jew or any Christian who hears of me, that is being Muhammad, and dies without believing in what I've been sent with will be an inhabitant of hell. This is a rigorously, rigorously authenticated Sahih Hadith that was, that was recorded by Muslim. Interesting, this is in the Sharia. Whoever seeks religion other than Islam will never have it accepted of him. 
oh, oui, the Sharia actually quotes Quran 385, as I did in the beginning. So that is the official standpoint of Islam. Bugger what any Muslim tells you, this is the official position. No one's way or spiritual works are acceptable unless they conform to the sacred law of Muhammad. Twelve pages long after abrogation. I just think that's funny. I think Pierce Taylor finds that amusing as well. <laughs> yeah. So we've covered this before. So um, the prophet said, now this is about knowledge of abrogated verses, just to push this home again, just to uh, slam this home. The generality of the prohibition also entails that whoever does not know which verses abrogate others and which are abrogated. So basically to be a jurist, right? To be a jurist, you have to know which verses abrogate others. It is compulsory for an imam, a jurist, a qadi, anyone who has a senior position in Islam has to know the points upon which there is scholarly consensus. So they have to know what is abrogated. Now, Sharia, biblical religions are abrogated, section eight. This is from Nawawi. This is the Minhaj at Taliban. And it's a manual of Mohammedan law from the school of Shafi. This is a very famous, this one is another one of the 24 Sheikh al-Islam, one of the top 24 scholars in Islam, the most revered scholars. Uh, Muhammad Amin's name will never be in that list, fortunately, thank goodness, but uh, he likes to think it is. So <laughs> notice, it is always blamable to marry a woman, whether Jewess or Christian, belonging to a nation not yet subjugated by our arms, by our weapons. So it looks like they have a mission to subjugate other nations by their weapons. By infidels whose religion is founded upon a holy scripture are understood that these people who follow one of the actually existing divine revelations, though abrogated by the Quran, i.e. Jews and Christians. This is the Sharia of Nawawi. Now it says here, Jewish blah, blah, blah. So that revelation was abrogated by the Quran and before the text of the law of Moses, the Torah had been altered by theologians. Very interesting. Um, someone said a little while ago, uh, or well, they asked if, uh, if abrogation, or sorry, if you can't change all his words, does that mean that abrogation changes his words? So let me put my legal scholar, i.e. a Muslim scholar hat on here and say, no, the words weren't changed. They just don't apply anymore. You know, there's a, there's a mil I used to work with military guys when I was in the Middle East and they used to talk about an MSU 13, which was a principle you applied when you didn't know what to do. And it's short for basically make stuff up 13. <laughs> You know, still in the own word for stuff there. But yeah, so so basically it just looks like it's a lot of MEC 13s being thrown around in the comments by people that we know. So going on, it says here, a judge must be Muslim, blah, blah, blah. And he must understand the Quran and the Sunnah and all the texts relating to jurisprudence, right? Whether they abrogated other texts or themselves abrogated by later ones. So in Nawawi's book, in Book 65, Administration of Justice, Chapter 1, General Provision, Section 1 of the Minhaj al Taliban, this manual of Muhammadan law by Nawawi, it says the Quran and the Sunnah, whether those are abrogated or whether they abrogate later ones. So this confirms, again, in the Sharia, and we are not supposed to argue with the Sharia, right, because it's the perfect law of Allah. So now we look at the Tafsir Asadi, which was recently translated. Thank heavens, I got a set. I got the full set. If anybody wants these books, I have them all. I've got actually my collection is now about 700 of the top Islamic scholarly manuals. I literally have about 700 of the best Surah, Hadith collections. Uh, I've got probably 20 or 30 um, Sharia manuals. So I, as I said, I've got about 700 of the top Islamic manuals all translated into English. So the Tafsir of Saadi talks about abrogation. This refers to abrogation of one verse by another. So abrogation is real. I mean, I've had too many Muslims tell me abrogation is not real because they mention here, you know, we replace one verse with another because it actually means exactly what it says. Abrogation, cancellation. Let's look at Tafsir Qurtubi. Now this guy, he's, his stuff is actually, there's like 20 volumes and I think only one's been translated into English so far, which is a pity because this guy really lays it out. Man, he lays it out well. He's very blunt. 
And he talks about the Medinan abrogates the Meccan in most of the Quran. It is not possible for the Meccan to abrogate the Medinan because the abrogated was revealed before the abrogating. And he says here, you will not learn the Quran until you know it's abrogating from its abrogated. This is one of the very top Tafsir scholars. Probably number two after, very possibly number two after uh, Ibn Kathir. And he says, you will not know the Quran until you know what's abrogated and what, you know. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very clear. And this is in the Tafsir al Qurtubi, classical commentary in the Holy Quran, translated by Aisha Buley. She's also a Sufi, by the way. I need to get into the Sufi thing just to annoy people. I like annoying people. So basically, <laughs> uh, what the scholar here is telling us is that you can't just read the Quran and understand it. You have to have the education. You have to go to school and learn all the rules about what was abrogated and what wasn't. Uh, yeah. If you just read the Quran straight through, you'll never know what it means, which of course is exactly why in the comment sections and such, Muslims play this game. Well, the Quran says this, and you know the average Christian isn't gonna know that, they, that that verse has been abrogated or that the understanding of it is different than the clear meaning of the text or whatever. Yeah. So they, they can truthfully say the Quran says blah, blah, but deceitfully not tell us about that the meaning isn't what it appears to be. Correct. And remember, we also we have the, 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 the mafhum and the mantuk. So you have all of these de weird legal devices on top of these things. Yeah. He was a Maliki scholar, by the way, one of the top Maliki scholars. And here we've got Ibn Kathir says, right, fighting the Jews and the Christians is legislated in the Sharia because they are idolaters and disbelievers. This 9.5 and 9.30, 929 do not, do not refer to just pagans. I saw David Wood had a discussion with Al Fadi on this point, and he said, well, this only applies to pagans. Unfortunately, that is not the case. It is not so in the Tafsir, and it is absolutely not so in the Sharia. Allah the Exalted encourages the believers to fight, that's the Muslims, to fight the polytheists, disbelieving Jews and Christians who uttered the terrible statement and utter lies against Allah. Jews claim that Zed was the son of Allah and the misguidance of the Christians of Isa, which is Esau, which is not Yeshua, not Jesus. It is obvious. This is why Allah declared both groups to, to be liars. They have no proof that supports their claim other than lies and fabrications. May Allah fight them. May Allah curse them. So this is an abrogation because if we go on, if we continue, he writes in 9.5 that the verse of the sword abrogated every agreement of peace between the prophet and any idolater, every treaty and every term, every contract of peace was at that point terminated. No idolater had any more treaty or promise of safety ever since Surah 9 was revealed. I think that is pretty clear. Chapter 9 is translated as immunity, sometimes as repentance. It is also translated as the ultimatum. So we have um, comment. Oh, Muhammad, I mean, sorry, just, uh, he says, no, you're reading books of early Islamic scholars. We know that the early Islamic scholars of the first three generations, the only ones that are reliable, because anything after that, remember, those people fell into misguidance. We covered that in a previous show. Yeah, that's actually what I was going to point out. I thought I took it the other way that he was agreeing that that was the proper way to know Islam is to read books of early scholars. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the, the comments seem very mute. I mean, look, I go, I am rigorous about quoting from the top best sources, right? Whereas they just absolutely use MSU 13s all over the place, right? That's what they do, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm being very, very detailed in bringing the best scholarship to bear. So my last couple of entries here before I finish. So this is from the short book on Muslim international law, the Kitab al-Siyad al-Sagir by Muhammad Shaybani. Right, Shaybani was, is known as the father of Muslim international law. He was an Islamic jurist and a disciple of Abu Hanifa who became the head of the, the founder of the Hanafi school of Islamic jurisprudence, right? So he wrote this book at the end of the eighth century and it provided detailed guidelines for the conduct of jihad against unbelievers, as well as the guidelines on the treatment of non-Muslim subjects under Islamic rule. So yeah, this is a book on how to wage warfare on unbelievers for the crime of being unbelievers and how to subjugate them using the religion of <clears throat> peace. 
war, sorry, religion of war. Prohibition of warlike operations during the sacred months has been abrogated. That confirms what we've just seen here. The four months, you know, the when the sacred months have passed, right? When the sacred months have passed, slay the idolaters wherever you find them and take them captive and besiege them and prepare for them each ambush. Quran 9.5. The prohibition of warlike operations during the sacred months has been abrogated. So now they are to go to war. It is reported from Mujahid that he says that the prohibition of war in the sacred months has been abrogated. The abrogating verse is the saying of Allah, then slay the polytheists wherever you find them. Quran 9.5, which has abrogated the verse. And they ask you concerning the sacred month and the war during it, say war in it is grave. Quran 2, 217. This is also the opinion of Abu Hanifa, right? The Hanafi school of law, the founder of that school. And Abu Yusuf, on the other hand, Kalbi used to say, this prohibition has not been abrogated, but we do not take the view of Kalbi. So we have a comment from Romeo here who says you guys need more followers. Well, thank you very much for enjoying our content. Uh, you can help with that by sharing the videos in YouTube comments, on your social media and whatnot. Uh, but mostly just thank you for enjoying the comment. We're our goal really here is just to uh, uh, equip Christians, um, any Muslims we reach in the, the, at the same time is great. But most of the real reaching of Muslims, I think, occurs in face-to-face -face conversations with people you actually know. So we're hopeful that this material is very helpful for that. Yeah, so these are my last two pages, which is this document. And I'll, I'll provide links that you can provide at the end. Um, so that then I'll be finishing. I'll be winding down here. But any, any thoughts from you guys, Sonia, that is? I'm just thinking that this, you can't get more clear. I mean, you've done it's completely thorough presentation on this whole thing about abrogation. It can't get more clearer than that now. So there should be no confusion, no uncertainty, no opportunity for them to come in and throw in a spanner. It's very clear, isn't it? And yes, from the earliest sources, which are more nice. accurate. Yeah, nice says, tell us your problem with abrogation. So first they lie that, no, there's no such thing. And now it's like, what's wrong with it? Yeah, so. Um, yeah, I, I think you Bible you've... Is a, geez, sorry, yeah, sorry, sorry, I was going to say, I think you've pretty much uh, managed to silence Muhammad Amin today. He came in here saying that we're liars and he's going to refute us and blah, blah, blah. And mostly he's just agreed with everything we've said the whole time because he he knows he can't deny it you're showing all the sources so he's like yeah yeah i agree this is this is part of islam what, yeah, so? this, this is islam i mean last week with he yell i mean that is islam it's legal trickery from top to bottom and it's run by lawyers it's a legal system run by lawyers it's not a religious system so this final document was written by a group called the motel group i think in 2002 and they make one or two small errors here which are minor but the overall point that they make is actually correct. And I want to go through this very quickly to end off. And then we can open it up maybe to some discussion. But this is the implication of abrogation. Abrogation equals jihad, bluntly. So Islam is easier to practice than most Muslim, than most followers know. Most of the Quran has been superseded. Only the remainder is in effect. And here is why. During more than two decades, Muhammad went from a beginner missionary to a virtual dictator with total power. He was vulnerable to the people of Mecca and then Medina with whom he lived. And he was greatly criticized and at risk because his ideas conflicted with those that prevailed. In the early days, his revelations were conciliatory, promoted peace and taught tolerance. The Quran evolved and grew and its message reflected Muhammad's growing power. He returned to Mecca as a conqueror. Muhammad was incredibly powerful, desperate, a leader not only of religion, but of politics. So he started as a, as a religious leader, then became a political leader, then became a religious, sorry, a military leader. As his power increased, his revelations became more aggressive and soon advocated violence to promote Islam. Slay them wherever you find them. His revelations reflect his circumstances during his political and religious career. Ibn Tabid's preparation of the Quran did not include editing to remove conflict with previous material because it was unnecessary. The Quran is a self-correcting document. When a commander's statement of a later chapter conflicts, with an earlier chapter, the Quran resolved the conflict. None of our revelations do we abrogate, blah, blah, blah. We've just discussed abrogation. Nusk is accepted by the Islamic scholar as a scholars as a doctrine that governs priority in the Quran. In case of conflict, the later surah always replaces an earlier one. 
called Munsuk, which can then be disregarded since it has been abrogated. As circumstances change for Muslims in general, and Muhammad in particular, the Quran changed as well. Some conflicts would be impossible to resolve without abrogation, such as two verses about wine. In Surah 2, 2 and 9 says that wine has some profit for mankind. But 590, a later surah, calls wine an abomination of Satan's handiwork. Muslim scholars agree that wine verses are a clear instance of abrogation. Without Nasq, a Muslim must acknowledge that Satan's handiwork offers some profit for mankind. Any comments from you guys before I go on? Well, Islam is just a mafia, isn't it? It's a mafia institution. It's legal. The guys at the top, again, of that pyramid... But they've got their hitmen, right, which is the jihadists of today, who the Western yeah. leaders keep saying have nothing to do with Islam. But yeah, well, uh, Islam has nothing to do with Islam, as far as I can tell. Right. So, so Quran is organized with the longest surahs first and the shortest ones last. So Muhammad normally began each surah with the invocation, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of Allah, the compassionate, the merciful, the man who can't speak English yet. But when is Allah going to learn to speak English? He only does Arabic. Like seriously, like honestly, someone, I'll, I'll raise, I'll throw in a couple of dollars, let's get him some English lessons, right? So anyway, Surah 9, certainly the most violent and intolerant and aggressive chapter of the Quran does not include this invocation. So the peaceful invocation, which implied the gift of security by Allah, was replaced by a sword to be wielded by Muhammad's followers in their jihad with the non-believers. Surah 9.5, slay the unbelievers, abrogated every agreement of peace between the prophet and any idolater, every treaty and every term. Surah 9 is understood as the Quran's last word in the promotion of violence, intolerance, and jihad. The rule of Nusk applies and only the violence survives. So this view is supported by Muhammad's biographer, Ibn Ishaq, actually Ibn Hisham, because we don't actually have the original words of Ibn Ishaq. We only have the edited ones, and he removed the worst of it, apparently, and it's still pretty bad. So at first, fighting was forbidden, then it was permitted, and after that, it was made obligatory. Right? He clearly identifies two groups that Muslims are obligated to fight. They who start fighting against Muslims, which is normal international law, and against they who worship gods other than Allah. Pakistani brigadier S.K. Malik's 1979 book, The Quranic Concept of War, says... The Muslim migration to Medina brought in its wake events and decisions of far-reaching significance. So in Medina, a divine revelation pro proclaimed them an ummah and granted them the permission to take up arms. That would be the second pledge of Aqaba, states that very clearly. A divine command making war a religious obligation for the faithful. The enduring command, the Nusk, make fighting, including jihad, obligatory. The revelations about jihad culminate in the command to fight to impose Islam and Sharia over the world. That is the correct interpretation. The peaceful, tolerant, and conciliatory surahs have been abrogated and truly can be ignored. A good Muslim who follows the valid portion of the Quran is a violent Muslim. Wow. So would it be safe to say, Lloyd, that we cannot trust the Islamic politicians, the Islamic congregation that come even on YouTube videos? We can't, we can't trust them. No, you can't. Um, look, we, we're at the moment in a, in a place of hood now. Look at this. Let me just let me just um, zoom into this, just to actually add to the point. This is chapter one. This is the Hadaya. So the sacred injunction. This is the Sharia manual by Nawawi. Um, no, that my Mahanani. The sacred injunction concerning war is sufficiently observed when it is carried on by any one party or tribe of Muslims. It is then no longer of any force with respect to the rest. It is established as a divine ordinance by the word of Allah, who has said in the Quran, slay the infidels. And also by saying of Muhammad, war is permanently established until the day of judgment, meaning the ordinance respecting war, enjoined for the purpose of advancing Islam. Mm -hmm. Jihad, fad, or ordained war, is to be waged against infidels. It is termed the holy war. Muslims making war no longer binding upon the rest. In other words, this, the, the small minority, as long as they make war, the rest can stay at home. If, however, no Muslim were to make war, the whole of the Muslims would incur the criminality of neglecting it. I'll pause that's there. Why, can, uh, I'm just thinking that's why a lot of British Muslims go to Syria, right? 
more British Muslims have gone to Syria to fight than have joined the British army. Wow. I mean, I went look into at this. the British army. <laughs> this My dad didn't want me that. In book nine, we have a bunch of pages, I mean, there's like 50, 60 pages of this, of the manner of waging war. And this is offensive war, not defensive. They do mention defensive war in passing of plunder and the division of plunder on the conquests of infidels. This is Islamic law. You can read this. This is, it's, man, it's actually fascinating reading, but it's horrifying as well. So, so I mean, I could, I could just go on and on and on and on for hours with this stuff, but I'll stop here. Hopefully I've made my point. Excellent. Thank you. That was very telling. My goodness. It's very exhaustive. I mean, there's so much in there, but this is, this all sounds like a legal documentation, isn't it? It is a legal document. These are all, it's all law. It's all wow. law. It's not religion. It's law. And uh, earlier, this is the book I was talking about, Ibn Taymiyyah, jihad expert. This was written like in the 1200s. And he talks about this, this, this is Sharia. This is, this has made it way into the Sharia. His writings became Sharia and it's about table of contents. Let me just zoom in again. The first claim of the Christians, refuting the claims of the Christians, proof that the messenger of Allah was sent to all mankind. You know, the proof of the prophet, glad tidings of the coming of the prophets, the Quran, blah, blah. I mean, they say that Jesus, Abraham, Moses, David, they were all Muslims. Noah was a Muslim. Of course, there was no yeah. Quran then, but what the hell? Right. Well, it's such an attack, isn't it? It's such an affront. But this is a part of their belief. You see, you have to believe in that to be a Muslim. And you also have to believe in their version of the last day, which is fighting Jesus. I mean, Jesus it's, it's a fight. setup. No, Jesus comes back. He fights at the right hand of Muhammad. He destroys the church. He breaks the cross. He kills the Jews. And he destroys Christianity. And I mean, this book discusses all of the original polemics against Christianity and the Bible in Islam come from this book. This is an 800, 900 year old book. But even That's Sufi good. Muslims would believe the same because they're not a more peaceful brand, are they? No, they're no, Sufis mystic. are an order. They're religious order. They, they are normal Muslims. They're Muslims from all walks of life. A Sufi is a regular Muslim. It's not a, it's not a school. Of, sorry, it's not a sect of Islam. It's just a school you, know, you can go to. It's like, you know, you just join a group. But the Sufis, yeah, the Sufis, we must talk about that one day. It's going to annoy a lot of people. But <laughs> the Sufis are the core of Islam. They are the central core, the most holy people in Islam. And Muslims will argue with you whole day, but it's in the Sharia. I can just pull out chapter after chapter after chapter. Uh, very good. So I think we'll open it up to questions now. Uh, Muhammad Amin earlier, and he's asked it a couple times, and I think that this one is actually um, fairly relevant. He asked, do you think Islam is false because it believes in abrogation? And I will give a couple thoughts on that, and then I'll ask you guys your thoughts as well. Um, Candace kept pointing out over and over again to Amin in the chat that uh, supposedly no one can change all his words. So why does abrogation exist? And of course he has no answer to that. And I would just say that if the Quran is supposedly the perfect word of a perfect God, it shouldn't need any changes. So I wouldn't say abrogation is near the top of my list of reasons why Islam is false, but it's certainly one piece of evidence. Uh, Sonia, you have any thoughts on that? I'm just, I'm just so many, goodness, I've got so many thoughts on this whole thing. I mean, on one hand, Islam considers itself the final extension of the Abrahamic faith, but yet it's very counter and in opposition to everything <clears throat> the Holy Bible stands for. It's very much Baal worship, you could say. It's, it's, a, it's a mess, it's a mafia, it's a legal system. And I don't think anyone, even Muslims, can just have an opinion on this. They have to go by, like Lloyd said in his presentation, it's a legal system. So it's very, you know, it's it's foolproof. That's how they want it to seem anyway. Lloyd, do you have any thoughts to add? Um, 
so the point that Sonia made that I that I should talk about, but I man, for some reason it just it just slipped my mind. But um, we've got Islam's a legal system, really. Remember, all these scholars are lawyers, legal scholars. So right. it's really a system run by lawyers. And remember, they've got hiyal, which is a form of legal deception, which allows them to circumvent any and every law in Islam. And it is it is not a religion in the sense that we know. It's also a political system. It is also a military system. And one just has to read the Sharia to see what it is. It's a it's a system of conquest. It is a it's a conquest ideology, mm-hmm. and it's entirely one hundred percent anti-Christian. Muhammad, when they talk about the fact that he broke every of the Ten Commandments, well, he explicitly did so because it is a denial of logos. It is a denial of God. It is in fact it is a revolt against God. And also, people have to realize that Islam is Gnosticism. Again, another controversial topic, one I will have to get into in the future. But if you read the Sharia, you learn that Islam is Gnosticism. It is a Gnostic religion. It is built on heretical Christian Gnostic beliefs, as well as Jewish mysticism. It it took elements of those and just did its own thing, went off and did its own thing. But it is Gnostic. The Sufis are the top tier of the Islamic ulama. They are the top ones running the religion. And it is a form of gnosis that rejects the external world, emphasizes the fantasy of the internal reality. And it's, it's insane. When you start reading through the Sharia and you start reading through the, the fact that it's gnosis, it is just nuts. It just, it just goes down that rabbit hole and you think that these people are batshit crazy. Someone's asking, how on earth is Islam Gnostic? Well, I think in the future, Lloyd probably will do a presentation on this to go in more detail, but it is to have this, um, you see, Gnosticism, we've always assumed comes from um, heretical Christian sort of fall away bishops and stuff, but no, no, because it's a lot more murkier than that, isn't it? When you read the Sharia, and look, the Sharia is the ultimate ultimate law in islam there is nothing higher than that it is the final say and when you restart reading through it i mean you start to learn some crazy things some crazy beliefs that are not beliefs that the lower level are taught right because remember last last show i showed the four levels in islam the, the lowest level is for idiots like Syed and muhammad amin then you've got the higher levels and these rule these teachings are only at those levels and the second level is gnostic through and through second third fourth levels are gnostic Sheikh Imran Hussain, very popular. He's very elderly now. I bet many Muslims here who are in the chat know who I'm talking about. He's a mystic. He's a Sufi mystic. He talks about the um, the illumination. If you read, if you read, there's a number of Sharia manuals like the Nur al Ida, the Light of Illumination, and so on. Ghazali was a Sufi. The top man in Islam after Muhammad was a Sufi. Muhammad himself, if you look at the stories told on the um, Islam Critique Channel. Muhammad was a mystic. He indulged in mystical practices. If you read through the Sharia manuals of Ghazali and others, it is mysticism. It is most definitely mysticism. There's no denying it, no mistaking it. And in fact, if you read through the Nur al-Idda by Ghazali, they call themselves the perfect Illuminati. Those words, verbatim, the perfect Illuminati. They call themselves the perfect Illuminati. You, You figure that out. You tell me what that means. I showed you that reference a couple of weeks ago, that is. But yes. they talk about that Allah is the illuminant and they are the illuminated. You work The real Allah. Illuminati? Yes. Oh, wow. Wow. I mean, there's reference after reference after reference. It's all in the Sharia. No one's bothered to read the Sharia. I read it. it gives me freaking headaches, but, but yeah. So uh, Lagos Media said that um, we covered how Islam is Gnostic on his show. So if he drops the link to that, uh, when we're done with this, I will put that in the pinned comment. Um, So Amin tried a new analogy. He compared uh, abrogation to fixing a broken car. A number of people have already pointed out how bad that analogy is. So I won't put it in detail. I'll just take uh, Maya's words here. And she says, is that what Islam does teaches you to limit God to something as pathetic as an old car. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, a couple of questions. Is Islam, can Islam be called a religion? No, it's a deen. Islam itself calls itself a deen. It, Islam does not refer to itself as a religion. It does not. Nowhere does it call itself a religion. In English they do because it's convenient because we as idiots 
don't read their text, but they do know in Arabic refer they, they're a deen. A deen, and I've, I've read the definition multiple times in the past on this show. It is a very complex system. It's about 14 or 15 different things it is before it's religion, which is the final, final thing that it is. But it's a legal system, political system, military system, and it all is focused on the subjugation of non-Muslims. And then religion is like the final portion right on the bottom. And someone also said, uh, uh, sorry, there was a question. Um, I'll get to it later. I'll find it. But uh, you guys, any thoughts from you? Uh, no, not on that. Um, I do have a comment that uh, Rory asked in the middle of the chat, and then I told him to bring back up at the end, and he did. So I want to get to that. He says, uh, can a woman get a divorce in Islam? I know it's not the topic of today, but. In theory, no, she cannot. The husband can divorce her, but there's a limit to what she can do. I mean, you can read about that. There's numerous. If you get a copy of the Reliance of the Traveler, you can actually read those laws. And if you need more detail, you can get the Hedaya or other books, and I can link you to dozens of them that will discuss it in, in excruciating detail. Uh, someone asked, are these Sufis today, and can you identify them? Most of these Sharia manuals, there are, there are many, many Sharia manuals that are Sufis in nature, that are specifically called the Sufis. These are legitimate Sharia manuals, and many of the scholars of Islam, the top scholars, were Sufis. But also today, most of the translators of these books, these Sharia manuals and other scholarly works are Sufis. I mean, they will debate you to, to the death on this point, but uh, they need to start dealing with it. You read through Nawawi's book, there's an entire chapter on Sufism. There's like seven different subsections on it. Very good. Uh, we had a question I wanted to get to. What was it? Oh, yeah. So the illuminated go around hating and killing everyone else. What yep. kind of drugs are they taking? <laughs> Obviously sure. tongue in cheek comment there, but I thought it was uh, pretty funny. That, you know, the, the supposedly best religion, the people who understand it best know that it teaches subjugation of all people. So what you're really saying when you say that you believe in Islam is that you believe it's okay for one group of people to take advantage of another group. If you read the Hedaya chapter, volume two, chapter two, and you read the section on the subjugation of the Dimmi, in fact, maybe I can do a show on that next. It, it'll horrify you. It will horrify you. I can discuss it. It goes into horrific detail on specifically how the Muslims are to treat people they've subjugated once they finally achieve domination it will horrify you there is no compassion there is no mercy it is it is slavery and extortion quite bluntly it's a mafia as sonia said yeah gaza i was looking into that earlier this week and i it's so oh it's very draining i couldn't even read like i didn't know where to begin well, I can give you an seems... entire presentation on it done already. I've already finished the complete presentation on it. I have plenty of work I've already written. I just, just never presented this stuff. It um, covers everything, it's... doesn't it? The Hidayah thing. It covers every single aspect of one's life. It's like three or 4,000 pages. It's pretty detailed. <laughs> These people are serious. It's not a joke, right? It's like they're, they're dead kidding. serious with this. People like Amin are like, they, they have no say in the matter. The ulama are wealthy, powerful people. You know, the, the, the ulama are really, really powerful men who have billions of dollars who run Islam. People like Amin and Syed are just useful idiots. I mean, they're idiots, right. as we can yeah. tell from what they say, but, but yeah, they're yeah. bad. Yeah, they you know, are useful idiots. They're ignorant as well. So Romeo asked, if Allah is all-knowing, why didn't he understand Mary was not part of the Trinity? And I think that's one of those that the only answer you can offer is Allah knows best. I mean, wh why did the... <laughs> the this this all be a kind of drug. <laughs> this all-knowing God of the universe uh, chooses to attack a straw man rather than the most popular religion on earth when he had the opportunity to actually attack a real belief he chooses to attack a made-up belief that there's no evidence anyone ever believed in, but even if a small, tiny sect somewhere believed in it, it's certainly not the mainstream Christian view. So why would an all-knowing God do that? Well, all knows best, I guess.
Yeah, Muhammad Amin really just is reduced to um, stupid platitudes and insults. It's really sad. I mean, look, I know, I know. I, I, I give him a hard time as well because um, he deserves it. But, but um, you know, the best time to kick a man is when he's down and he looks a little down right now. So, um, yeah. Um, no, look, it's just that, that I am... Everything I've presented, I can provide you with every single book. You've seen all the references. I have, as I said, I've got a library of about 700 of the most authoritative Islamic books. All of this is available to anyone who wants it. And um, it's it's no argument. I mean, Muhammad Amin can make up what he wants. I mean, the rhetoric is useless because we've, we've actually got all the facts. This is Islam, you guys. This is it. This is what Islam is, you see. It's not what I, what I think or what I wish I think it is. <laughs> this yeah, is no. it. This is the very sophisticated system, legal system. Yeah. I mean, he's probably learning a lot of this for the first time as well, you know. But also, there they are prohibitions in Sharia in revealing the secrets of the Muslims, and this is what I'm doing, you know. And um, there's very good reason why they don't want their own people to know this stuff, I guess. It would upset them. I mean, Muhammad swimming amongst dead dogs and drinking the water where people threw sanitary pads. Dogs like disgusting. It's yeah. barbarism. I mean, and how do you is... how do you denounce a man who had sex with a nine year old girl and where it says also? I mean, if you read through the Sharia, there's various prohibitions that say you have to love Muhammad more than your whole life, more than your family, more than your wealth, more than your possessions. You must love him more than anything else, not more than Allah, more than anything else. Which, yeah. which technically, well, then you have to love him more than Allah, right? In theory. And it also says that you, it is blasphemy to believe that Allah and Muhammad are not perfect. So how can you criticize a man if you are forced to believe that he is perfect? Yeah, no. that's what the blasphemy law is there. See, they've even covered their backs there as well. Blasphemy against right. Muhammad, not against Allah. You can say what you like about him. There's not going to be World War Three, is there? Yeah. If you read through the Sharia, and um, again, this is stuff that's like early days. I need to get into this, but... Um, Ezekiel, we're not talking about Ezekiel 20, 25, Muhammad. We're talking about your stuff, your books. Um, I mean, they, they have to. They can't debate on the subject. They, they have to move off the topic. Um, but if you look through some of these Sufi discussions and some of the other Sharia manuals, they speak of that. And I, I'm, I'm going to have to stand corrected on this. I'm going to have to look into this again. I, I could be wrong here, but um, they speak of that Allah might not be the supreme deity. There might be a deity beyond Allah. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you so much for this presentation. It's just it just put another nail in the coffin, really. That's it. There's no other way around it. So hold on. So you've got United Arab Emirates making this building for they're building a synagogue, a church, and a mosque to show some sort of social cohesion within the UAE. What's that? That's a load of nonsense, isn't it? Look, I don't know. I, I get the feeling I lived 11 years. I liked Dubai. It was a great place. I mean, I, I did very well there career-wise. And it's it's got its positives. But on the one hand, I, I honestly occasionally used to get the feeling that if if the Sheikh of, of Dubai could could leave Islam tomorrow, he would. But it, he, would, he would suffer vicious penalties if he did. But I sometimes had the feeling this guy was just done with this stuff and would prefer to just move on and become like Europe, you know. And B... It also says very clearly in the same book that, that I referenced earlier that peace is considered the same as war in Islam if peace furthers their aims mm -hmm. as war would. And they right. need to abandon the peace the moment that peace does not provide the benefit and switch back to war. Well, that sounds like Islam to me. That's, uh, that sounds like exactly how they would forge any let's say any peace treaty even with israel it sounds just like the same just to further the agenda a little more you know regather mm. rearm give them time yeah oh yeah. it's not so good, I, it's not so good. To, did you guys learn anything new about abrogation i mean in this discussion that i provided did you guys learn anything new a about abrogation and b things you didn't know and b the implications of abrogation yeah um i think that the presentation really nails down the point that abrogation is a lot more than just the verse on breastfeeding five times and a couple other things that Muslims admit to. Um, and, you know, sometimes 
sometimes they admit to the Quran abrogating the Quran. Um, and mm-hmm. Christians talk about that. But I've never really heard anyone talk about how, in reality, the legal scholars have abrogated the, the Quran and to some extent even the Hadith in that they've established the authoritative interpretation of those things. So then the original texts are pretty much irrelevant because you're not allowed to question their interpretation. So the, the text doesn't mean anything, really. Like I said, it's 12 pages thick off the abrogation. The Quran is like this now. It's toilet paper. I mean, sorry, my bad. It's, 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 just, it's just a handful of pages now. You know, this is the, why I think most Muslim apologetics, so I don't know why they call themselves that, because they focus on polemics, you see, they don't they don't defend their text because they know. <laughs> they, they know. Don't. They know all about it. You see, we don't though. Now we are more educated, we're mm. more informed about it now. Now we know what the tactics are. You never see them defending their text as much as they attack Christianity, you see. Mm. They always go on the offensive, and I would really encourage us to do the same <laughs> that's what i'm doing and um, i am using their best best scholars and their best sources now they've got to lie about their top scholars and their top books yeah they know they can't defend so why waste time doing that let's go on the offensive islam is the offensive right it is an onslaught it is an attack hmm. i mean we're supposed to pray behind muhammad ibn kathir says we are supposed to submit and pray behind Muhammad. You're supposed to bow yeah. and pluck right behind him. I'm like, you know, seriously, if I ever get behind Muhammad, I am bringing a uh, a rather large cucumber and a jar of vaseline. Excuse <laughs> <laughs> my French. That's very uh, so Rory said that when you were earlier, when you were describing uh, what Muslims are required to believe about Muhammad, that sounds a lot like worship. And they said, I think you made a video on that. And indeed I did. Uh, a couple videos ago, I think it's called uh, Muslim Apologist Shocks Everyone when he admits that Muslims worship Muhammad or something like that. Basically, I just took his exact words and read, played the clip of his words and then read a hadith. And then I played more of his words and I read another hadith, uh, basically proving that according to his own criteria, Muslims worship Muhammad which I mean, I think it's pretty obvious. Um, Mm -hmm. For example, I've never heard of any Muslims rioting over uh, a depiction of Jesus or a depiction of Moses or even a a comic about Allah. They only get mad when when you make fun of Muhammad. So clearly Muhammad is the number one object even above Allah in Islam. Mm hmm well, Muslims were initially called Muhammadans, which is, I think, the most appropriate way of referring to Muslims is Muhammadans, like we are Christians after Christ, Christ-like. Or, well, remember, you know, the, the, the Sharia states bluntly, Muhammad is the perfect man. He's the most perfect man who ever lived, except he had to have lice picked out of his hair. Right? That's he had the standard of perfection. And he went to mosque with semen on his clothes. He had a child that, that urinated over him and he didn't wash himself. Oh. Good stuff there. Yeah, uh, what an example. So Romeo asks, where does Baka Bazi come from? And I don't Baka Bazi. Oh, yeah, no, no, that's that um, in Afghanistan, I think. Yeah, it's, it's actually, well, it, let's, I mean, look, if you look at the, um, the Zoroastrians had a concept of paradise that involved obviously women whose hymens grew back every day. So you could basically have sex with a virgin every night. And uh, you had your fill of all these hooties, but also there were young boys with soft faces and doe eyes that would feed you grapes. And uh, you, they, they kind of left you hanging as to, uh, you know, why were these boys so uh, soft faces and doe eyes? Like, um, hmm, yeah. But um, I mean, there are actually, you know, let's, let's, I would rather actually do the research in this one and come up with a solid answer based on references and talk about it. But um, look, every single law, as we discovered in Islam, is can be broken through heal, through through legal deception. There is no ultimate authority. There is no ultimate morality in Islam. So uh, Jeff asks, is it true that the Catholic Church helped write the Quran? Um, I'll yeah. take that one. Uh, 
basically the answer in the, in the sense you mean it is certainly no. There is no conspiracy to create a new religion by Catholic priests or uh, leaders of the Catholic Church or anything like that. Now, it is true that the Quran borrows elements from Christianity, and the only form of Christianity at that time was Catholicism. So mm -hmm. in that sense, the Quran steals some stuff from Christianity. But no, there was no plot. To it also steals. Wait, what about the idiots who say, oh, no, the, the Jews wrote Islam? And like, OK, so how about you two conflicting groups getting to a ring together? Then there are idiots who say the Swiss the pharaohs that, who are now in Switzerland wrote Islam. And then there are those who said, like, I've even seen people claim that Napoleon wrote the Quran and made Islam. How about you guys? You can't all be right. Like, seriously, the, the Quran borrows from the Talmud. It has, it has altered sayings from the Talmud. It's got altered sayings from Zoroastrianism, Sabaeanism, and multiple other religions. It's got little elements of everything. Islam is just an amalgam of identity theft. You know, it steals it's a little Gnostic. bit of this, <clears throat> stole a little day, bit of that, right? If you look at it, it's a mystical Gnostic religion. It's Gnostic mysticism, really. You go through, where they talk about those that know in, the, in multiple places in the Quran, like for instance, Jesus did not die on the cross. Jesus was rescued and only those that know, those with knowledge, it, it emphasizes those with the knowledge would know. Knowledge, gnosis, they're referring to the gnosis. Those are Gnostic beliefs. Those were heretical Christian beliefs. Islam is anti-Christian in every possible way. It is the ultimate antithesis. It is the, you know, of, of Christian belief of God. Yes, it is. I agree. I agree hundred percent. It is it. That's it. <laughs> we have a new comment from Muhammad Amin and this is going to be the last time that I entertain such a stupid comment, but he says, Matthew five is borrowed from the Talmud which is pretty much the most ridiculous thing I have ever heard, considering the Talmud was written between the year 250 and 450, and Matthew was written in the first century. And then additionally, even if Matthew 5 did borrow from the Talmud, that would not uh, do anything to save the Quran borrowing from the Talmud. Well, God, we see examples in the New Testament. Well, Jesus does, because he was, remember, he was considered a rabbi by the Pharisees. He was familiar with the oral law. So he references things which are now today seen in the Talmud, but he was familiar with Jewish law. He grew up in a Jewish milieu. So obviously he was familiar with their laws. He debated the Pharisees in the temple. Yes. So I, um, just adding on to that. So let, let's take it. Let's take his ridiculous idea, for example, yeah. as true for a second and say that Matthew 5 borrowed from some existing text. Uh, so what? No one says that the Bible was dictated word for word by God. It was written by human authors and their inspiration for God. We believe it was written, the Gospels, for example, were written in the first century. If they reference something that was going on in the first century, that's not a problem. If they talk about history from prior to that time, that's not a problem. But your view of the Quran is that it was, it's all as eternal word. It was created or uncreated, depending on your opinion on that before the earth was created. So why is it referencing human texts that were available in seventh century Arabia? Why does it have history that was known in seventh century Arabia, but no history that occurs after that? Mm. Why does your God feel the need to copy from human authors? Yeah. Yeah. Also the it's Old really Testament. Steady. It's getting all personal now in the comments. Yeah. All, and the New Testament all... references the Old Testament directly about 829 times and indirectly like another 260 times. So you've got about 1,100 references from the New Testament referencing the old. I mean, it borrows from because it's one continuous narrative from beginning to end. All right. I think that we covered most of the comments. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I missed a few because, um, you know, I'm paying attention as people are talking, not in the comments constantly. But I think we had a really good chat today. I think that this was, I think this was the best show to date. So if you guys have ideas for future shows, I mean, we have a couple more things we want to cover for sure, but if there's specific things you want to cover us to cover, then put those in the comments yeah. section. Um, you know, if we don't get any comments, then we decide what to talk about and what we want to talk about might not be what you want to hear. So 
if you can help us out by letting us know what you want to hear, that way we make sure it's relevant and useful to people. Yeah, I have enough material for about at least another 15 to 20 shows on Islam alone. Uh, but I want to start wrapping up Islam and um, focus more on, uh, I want to go through the Talmud, do a few sections on the Jews and the Talmud, especially the, the look, I'm not saying that I agree with the Talmud, that the Talmud is amazing, it's, but I want to clarify specifically what it is, what the lies are that are being told about it. And um, obviously we disagree with the Pharisees, but I want to bring this down to a reasonable discussion based on truth and facts. And then I'd like to move on towards biblical subjects more and more. Uh, one closing comment, Muhammad Amin is saying he's ready for debate in the comment section. Uh, that's he's perfectly fine. In the comment section. He's, ready, he's ready to try to post his usual out of context nonsense by non-authoritative sources and deceive us. Um, that isn't gonna work, Muhammad. So either bring authoritative sources, scholarly commentary on the Bible, uh, talk about the subject of this video or something like that, your usual crap is just going to be deleted, so don't waste your time. Yeah. Why doesn't he make a video using the best Islamic sources and show that I am wrong in everything I'm saying, that his sources, his Sharia sources, that we can all verify, say something else, that I'm misquoting them. How about that? Make a video. You know? Yeah, I mean, he, he constantly makes this claim that he's going to prove we're lying, and then we ask for a source, and then he's like, oh, never mind, I agree with you guys completely. This is what Islam <laughs> teaches. <laughs> I almost feel sorry for him and the like Saeed. I don't know where Saeed went anyhow. I took a break. He got <laughs> mad when break. I put him in timeout and left. Oh, right. Okay. This is a really good presentation. A lot of hard work went into that. Thank you, Lloyd. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, Muhammad's 18 years old now. Just like um, like expired, like Didat was suddenly 18 years old. Like 16. Oh, he's 16. <laughs> Sure, he is. We believe. Right. You're Chinese as well, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just, I don't know. The comments honestly make me laugh. Yeah, yeah. So carnal, right? Carnal and fleshy, so ridiculous. Yes, whatever. So All I right. You, um, I hope that was useful to everyone. Yep. I think that we're going to call it at night or morning or afternoon, whatever time of day it is, wherever you are. Thank you all for tuning in and be sure to stay tuned for the next video in this series, uh, you know, two to three weeks from now or so. We'll let you know when we're closer to having that um, a date picked. So thanks for tuning in and have a good night. Good night. Hi. <laughs>